two, let's pray. Father in heaven above, we worship you as the sovereign God who rules over all, our creator, our redeemer, the one we call Abba, Father. Thank you for your love this day. Thank you for your gift of salvation. And we thank you, Jesus, for taking up our cup, which we could not bear. Thank you for taking our punishment, our death, so that we might live forever. May your eternal life well up within us today as we worship you, as we thank you, as we surrender our lives once again to you. You are Master and Lord. Our hearts cry out for more of you. In Jesus' name. The good news this morning is that we've got three days behind us now of the new stay-at-home order. That means there's only 25 left to go. We can do this. One day at a time, we can endure. We can persevere. And it'll be good for us as we learn to endure. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. Number 125, sing the first and last. Wonderful word of the King, Jesus is coming. 
what a wonderful day it will be. Jesus is coming again. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Matthew 24. Is part of the teaching of Jesus during Passion Week. After the triumphal entry, as he's preparing himself and his disciples for his arrest and crucifixion. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came to him for to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left one here one stone upon another that should not be thrown down. And as Jesus sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when? Number one, when shall these things be that the temple will be destroyed? For they know if, in order for the temple to be destroyed, the city will have to be destroyed. The nation will have to be destroyed. Or they would have never allow the temple to come falling down. When shall this destruction happen? And what will be the sign of thy coming? Thy parousia is the Greek term. It means, when will you appear as king? Our king. And thirdly, what will be the sign of the end of the world? Or the end of the age. Now it seems to me in the disciples' minds, these three events are all intertwined, interconnected, and will happen in their lifetime. What did happen in AD 70, when the Roman army came to squash a Jewish rebellion against Rome, and they ended up destroying God's temple and the city of Jerusalem. And they wiped the nation of Israel off of the globe until 1948. And it seems to me that what happened in AD 70 will be repeated again at the end of the world. But on a much, much bigger what the disciples are asking is for a sign. What will be the sign that we know this is going to happen? Verse 4. When Jesus answered and said unto his disciples, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. So, Jesus' first instructions for his disciples and for you and I. What does he want us doing as the end approaches? A. Do not let yourself be deceived. For there will be many cons. Many frauds. There will be many people claiming to be more than they are. And if we are not on our toes, we could be deceived. For it says, many shall be. So that's the first instruction. Do not be deceived. Verse 6. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. There's our second instruction from Jesus. As we approach the end, be not troubled. Or, be calm, don't worry. No matter what's happening in the world around us, even though there's wars and rumors of wars, God doesn't want his children to be in a panic, to be worried. For all these things must come to pass. And I underline must. We, we can... We can protest against wars, but they must happen. 
They will happen. We can fight our loss of freedoms. But these things must happen. We, we can pray against persecution. But these things must happen as the end times approach. So be not troubled. Be not worried. But the end is not yet. The end is coming. It will come. But it is not yet. Verse 7. For nation shall rise against nation. The second list I'd like you to make is of those things that must happen between now and the end. Here's the first. Nation shall rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. In other words, war. War is going to happen. It's been happening since before the flood. And it's going to happen more and more as time goes on. And there shall be famine. That's the second thing. World hunger. There's been famine in the world since the days of Joseph. But we will see it more and more. World hunger. Number three, pestilences. Those are pandemics and plagues. They've been around for a long time. But they're getting closer and closer together. More and more powerful. And earthquakes. Wasn't there another one last night? Where was it? Indonesia this time? Java. There will be earthquakes in diverse places or various places. But all these things are just the beginning of sorrows. Now this word sorrows is often translated birth pangs. It's a word associated with mothers in labor. So, if these things he's talked about in verse 7 here are just the beginning of the troubles to come. Mothers, help me here. Are the, the birth pains going to get easier or harder as we go on? Are they going to come Closer together or farther apart? Yeah, I thought so. But there's good news here. Labor pains always take us somewhere. Labor pains result in joy. Right? Something good is about to happen. Because of these sorrows, these birth pangs, what is going to be birthed out of all this? A new world order. A new world. And we'll talk about more of that as we go along. Verse 9. Then, you'll find in Matthew 24, there are lots of words that indicate chronology. Especially this word then. Matthew 24 is very much a chronological teaching. He's put things in order. One thing happens after another, after another. Then, he says, they shall deliver you up to be afflicted and shall kill you, and ye shall be hated of all nations for my name's sake. So this is number five of the things that's going to happen in the days to come. Persecution. Persecution not because of your race, not because of your nationality. Persecution not because you've been protesting against the government. Persecution for the name of Jesus. 
Persecution only because you carry his name. Because you proclaim his name. Now this happened in the first century. Leading up to AD 70 in the destruction of the temple. And it's going to happen again. Leading up to the final destruction. Verse 10. And then shall many be offended. Some tra many translations say many will fall away. There's going to be a great falling away. Remember how Peter in his first epistle described Jesus as being a stumbling block? And, and how Paul talked in 1 Corinthians 1 about the cross of Christ being foolishness to the Gentiles. A stumbling stone. That's what he's talking about. An offense. As the destruction comes, the natural disasters, and then the persecution, many will be offended and will fall away. That's number six. Number seven, and many shall betray one another and shall hate one another. Is this within the body of Christ or in the community at large? Even within the church. Brothers and sisters are going to betray one another. As we hear about all the time in communist nations. And will even hate one another. Within the family of God. Can, can you believe it? it, it it's hard to understand. But, but I've been listening lately. I was listening last year to the Christians in the U.S. On the left and on the right. And there has become such a great divide in the church of Jesus Christ. Because politics has taken precedent over the family of God. And over the faith. The brothers and sisters refuse to go to the same church. Because of their differing political views. And even here in Canada. Those who are Christians who are opposed. To wearing masks. And social distancing. Are refusing to go to church. With those scaredy cats who do wear them. For the protection of themselves and others. And it goes the other way as well. So when persecution comes. People begin to be offended. And to betray one another. I can see the divide getting in. Curious, do you think the rapture has happened yet at this point? If the body of Christ is turning on each other, apparently the Christians are still in the thick of it. Verse 11 And many false prophets shall rise. That's number nine of the things that are going to happen in the days to come. Many false prophets shall rise and shall deceive many. Are they going to deceive the believers or the non-believers? Both. But their main target is the followers of Jesus. Verse 12. And because iniquity shall abound. Iniquity means sin. That's number 10. There's going to be an abundance. Abundance of wickedness. We ain't seen nothing yet. Wickedness is going to spiral out of control. And because of that, the love of many shall wax cold. Love will melt away. That, that again, that's, that's hard to comprehend. 
I, I, I appreciate when a crisis comes to our community that the news reporters try to in the midst of all the chaos and destruction like tornadoes or floods or pandemic they try to include a good news story of neighbors helping neighbors and some of the stories are so encouraging so inspiring I love to hear those stories but as we approach the end that natural love for neighbors and friends will wax cold and disappear as wickedness increases as persecution increases, as destruction and disaster grows, as people betray one another, that natural love, even for our own kin, will fade away, and it will be every one for themselves at the end. Except among the faithful followers of Jesus Christ. Verse 13. But he that shall endure unto the end, that means to persevere, this is the third instruction of Jesus. What he wants us doing as the end approaches. He wants us to endure, to persevere unto the end. Unto the end of what? Unto the end of the age, unto the end of the world, unto the end of history as we know it. The same shall be saved. Salvation is for those who endure to the end. Verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. For a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. How long do we have to persevere, endure? Until the end. We don't know a timeline. We don't know how many years. We don't know the hour. But we shall continue to spread the word. And I mean, we're getting very close to getting the gospel into every tribe. We're getting close to getting the scriptures translated into every major language on earth. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation that Daniel spoke about in chapter 12 of his prophecy. When you see the abomination standing in the holy place, the holy place usually thought of to be the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. The holy place. But it doesn't have to be the temple in Jerusalem. Didn't Paul call you and I living stones being built together into a dwelling place for God, into a temple for the Most High God, that He might dwell among us. So, verse 15 could be talking about some false god, some idol being erected in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem, that desecrates the temple and makes it unholy. Or he could be talking about some anti-Jesus figure who plants himself in the midst of the body of Christ and desecrates the family of God. We'll have to wait and see. Verse 16. Then, let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. 
That's his fourth instruction for us. If we're living in, Jeru in Israel at the time, run away. That's his instruction for us. Run away if you're living in Israel. What are God's people going to be fleeing from? Invasions, attacks, foreign armies, probably a nuclear bomb. That's what fleeing into the mountains makes me think of. Why only people who are living in Israel? Because if you've read any Bible prophecy at all, you know the focus in the last days will be on that little strip of land in Palestine. The promised land. That's where the Antichrist's anger is going to be unleashed. That's where the Battle of Armageddon will occur. And that's probably where the last great nuclear explosion will happen. Let's drop down to verse 21. We're running out of time. For then shall the great tribulation, that's number 12 of the things that are going to happen in the future, the great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake. Who are the elect? The chosen one of God. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. The elect are God's children. Verse 23. Then, if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or over there, believe it not. In other words, don't be deceived. He repeats this. Because it's so important. More and more. People are going to claim to be. The Savior. The returned Messiah. Don't believe it. Unless you see the sign. And there's only one sign Jesus said. And unless you see that sign. Don't believe it. 24. For there shall arise false Christ, false messiahs, and false prophets, and they shall show great signs and wonders. I mean, there were false messiahs even back before Jesus came the first time. This is not anything new. But these signs and wonders will be new. Great signs and wonders. These false messiahs will have incredible power to work miracles. Very convincing miracles. And it may just be starting. Insomuch that if it were possible... They shall deceive the very elect. Who are the elect? In Colossians 3.12, St. Paul calls the Christians in Colossae the elect of God. The Jewish and Christian believers, the followers of Christ, both Gentile and Jewish, together, as what Paul calls one new man, one new people under God. We are the elect. So when these false messiahs begin to appear, doing their signs and wonders, are, is the church still here? Are the Christians, the elect, still here? Apparently so. Verse 27. 
For as the lightning cometh out of the east, and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Could this be the rapture? This is the parousia. And every eye shall see it. If the rapture is something secret, this isn't it. Every eye shall see him, shall behold his coming. 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days. The tribulation, most scholars say, is a seven year period at the end of time. Immediately after the tribulation, the sun shall be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, the stars shall fall from the heaven, and the powers of the heavens, or the spiritual powers, shall be shaken. And then shall appear the sign that the disciples were asking for. And what will that sign be? The sign of the Son of Man in heaven. The only sign given is Jesus in the clouds. Anyone who claims to be a savior and they haven't appeared in the clouds, it's not Jesus. No matter what kind of miracles they do, no matter what kind of power they seem to have, no matter how great a preacher they are, if they haven't appeared in the clouds so that every man and woman on the face of the earth sees them coming, they are not the Christ. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, that all people will weep. Are they weeping for joy or weeping in sorrow? Depends whether they've been waiting for this day. Depends if they're ready or not. We shall weep with joy. I tear up just thinking about that day. But the majority, I fear, will cry in grief and sorrow and mourning, for they realize that what they have rejected all their life was true after all. And they have missed out. Where were we? And they shall see the Son of Man coming. That's number 13. On your coming events list. And they shall see the Son of Man coming. Parousia. In the clouds of heaven. With power and great glory. And God shall send his angels. With a great sound of the trumpet. I'm particularly fond of trumpets. And they shall gather together his elect. Number 14. The angels shall gather to Jesus his elect. All of his followers. All of God's children from the four winds. From the four corners of the earth. From one end of heaven, the heavens to the other. In other words, from horizon to horizon. This sounds like the rapture. The gathering together to Jesus. After the tribulation, with the trumpet, with great glory and fanfare. Verse 42. Watch therefore. There's our fifth instruction as we approach the last. Watch. Be watchful. Be alert, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Therefore, be ye also ready. Be ready. For in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man will appear as King and Messiah. Who then is a faithful and wise servant? Does that describe you? That's the last of his instructions. 
He wants us, as the end time approaches, to be faithful and wise and serving. Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. Let's quickly review what we need to be doing as we approach the final days. He says, do, do not be deceived, don't worry, endure or persevere, run for your lives if you're living in Jerusalem, watch be alert, be ready, be faithful, be wise, and be servants. Serving God, serving each other in the body of Christ, and serving our neighbors in the name of Jesus. That's our job description. These are the things we must be doing as the second coming approaches. You'll notice in this list, there is no call to take up arms to fight climate change. Or to fight for our rights and freedoms. Or to fight for democracy. Or to protest nuclear weapons. I mean, all those things can be good. But they're not on the top ten list of priorities of our Heavenly Father. For His children, His servants, in these last days. We need to focus, friends. Some things are going to be more important than others. And it doesn't appear... From Matthew 24 at least. It doesn't appear to me. That we're going to escape. The persecution. Of the last days. By being secretly raptured. Before the trouble starts. It sounds to me. Like we're going to be in it. Until natural death. Or martyrdom. Or we see Jesus. Coming into class. I, I gotta be honest, I'm hoping for number three. But his call for us until that day comes is to endure, to persevere, and to be faithful unto the end. Pat's going to come back to the keyboard in a moment so we can sing a chorus together. But I've got one last question for you. What comes next after Matthew 24? After the tribulation? After all the labor pains are done? After the end, then what? A new world. The kingdom of God on earth, for which we have been praying in the Lord's Prayer for 2,000 years. It's going to happen. The millennium, paradise, reigning with Jesus, the marriage supper of the Lamb, the new Jerusalem, heaven on earth. What we're seeing these days are but the beginning of labor pains. Be assured, it's going to get worse before it gets better. But something good is about to happen. Something good is on its way. A new world order where Jesus is king. And his will is done. And his love covers the earth. 
What a day that will be. Are you ready? Are you eager? Let's press on. There are great times coming. There are great celebrations coming. What we're going through right now is nothing, Paul says, compared to the glory, compared to the joy that awaits us. Oh, hallelujah. Would you pray with me? Come, Lord. We are eager for your return. We are waiting in anticipation of thy kingdom in all its fullness and glory. We can't wait to see you in all your majesty. Thank you, Lord, for giving us some instructions for these difficult days. Help us, Lord, to be wise and faithful. Help us to be alert so that we don't be deceived by the evil one and those who come in his name. Help us to rest in you, to live in peace and assurance, knowing that you are in control, that all things are going to work out for our good and for your glory if we just endure to the end. So we commit ourselves again this day to be your servants, faithful and wise. Speak, Lord. Your servants are eager to serve you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our soon coming King. If Pat will help us, we're going to sing. Soon and very soon, we are going to see the king.